Uh, welcome everyone. So today I want to share with you some information, some uh, my experience and my journey of moving Kickass to production. Uh, almost all of this experience is based on uh, work with recent client, but uh, I also have experience running Kickass in production for previous clients, and uh, I will include some information from these projects as well. So today I'm going to share with you general information what is EKS, just to recall. Uh, I will tell you why we decided to move with EKS, uh, what drive us. Uh, I will tell you about uh, our project in a few words, uh, just to know uh, what we are facing. Uh, I will show you some simplified architecture. Uh, I will tell you about uh, services we found that are useful for us and our use case and uh, could be useful for other, other use services as well. I will tell you about uh, limitations from UKS and from uh, AWS uh, that we faced. Uh, I will briefly talk about uh, resource allocation and why we need it and what is for. Uh, also, we performed, recently performed a DKS version upgrade, so I will share some knowledge there. Uh, about cost saving, uh, I will share one, one useful experience, uh, how we found uh, what we can, on what, which resources we can save and uh, what it gave us. Uh, also, during this journey, we faced uh, several technical issues uh, that are pretty interesting for me and uh, not common uh, scene, and uh, I also want to share it. Uh, then to, I will share what, uh, what's left uh, to complete this migration, and uh, hopefully we will have some time for questions and answers. Uh, just... Uh, for your information, uh, this migration is still in progress. We are not running UKS uh, in production yet, but uh, we are very close. Uh, we had the plans to do it earlier, but due to COVID, uh, we shifted our uh, time. Uh, we have other priorities other from that. Uh, so, in a few words, uh, what is EKS? Uh, EKS, it is managed Kubernetes service provided by uh, AWS. Uh, it uh, gives you managed uh, Kubernetes control plane and you can create your own worker nodes uh, based on EC2 instances or based on AWS for gate. Uh, in recent months, AWS uh, allowed you to create uh, managed worker groups, but uh, we still use uh, worker groups that we manage by our own. It has a uh, few limitations. Uh, it is uh, far, it is behind uh, official Kubernetes version, so uh, you have to pay attention to, to it. Also, cost for running EKS uh, control plane is uh, Lower than, than uh, creating uh, master nodes uh, for your own and managing it. Also, it is HIPAA compliant, so you can use it uh, with in healthcare products. Uh, so, why we decided to move to EKS? Our customer has uh, running infrastructure for about four years in AWS and uh, it works pretty stable, but uh, during uh, the last year, they faced uh, some limitations. Uh, the biggest limitation is uh, scalability. They don't, uh, do not have uh, efficient ways to scale their infra infrastructure, and also they wanted to speed up their development and uh, have, have uh, the same kinds of infrastructure across all the environments. So the main goal is uh, speed up development uh, by providing more agile practices. Uh, have to have like to like environments, uh, 
to be able to identify possible uh, bugs as early as possible. Uh, also, it uh, goal is to improve scalability by uh, implementing different scaling policies and also it gives uh, improved uh, release management. So our use case, uh, our customer works in healthcare domain. Uh, our development uh, is based on principles that every change uh, should be tested and developed in isolation. So on every branch, on every change, uh, developers create their own uh, dynamic environment. We call it environment on demand. Developers and uh, QAs uh, have CI jobs that uh, spins up fully working environment with all the dependencies in about 10 minutes. And uh, these environments are uh, separated in uh, different namespaces in uh, Kubernetes clusters. We have multiple clusters uh, separated by teams and by departments. Uh, we have uh, pretty good automated testing. Uh, all backend and front ends are covered by these testings, and uh, we have continuous feedback by uh, giving uh, test results uh, on every push to code repository. Uh, a few words about architecture. It is a simplified diagram of what we are running in AWS. So to understand it, uh, here are um, two things that are very important. It is a platform and cluster. Uh, general saying platform is a combination of uh, AWS resources like uh, VPC, subnets, security groups and so on. And platform runs uh, multiple EKS clusters in it. Also platform has its own uh, EKS clusters that it used uh, for management stuff like Rancher, Grafana, Kibana, Prometheus, and some system uh, components. Uh, pl per platform, uh, we usually have uh, different kind of environments. So we could say that platform is uh, development environment or QA environment or staging environment. And in, in each platform, we have multiple clusters that are uh, tied to separate teams. Um, about uh, cluster and TKS, it is pretty standard uh, architecture. We have uh, private and public subnets. Uh, all the worker nodes are running in uh, private subnets and all the load balancers are created in public subnets. Uh, we also have multi as the deployments across three, uh, three availability zones. Uh, also platform includes some uh, tools, uh, some AWS tools for monitoring, logging and so on. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, services that we found is very useful for us. Uh, first of all, it is Vivero tool, uh, formerly known as uh, Heptio Arc. Just tool that allows you to create backups, uh, restores, and uh, migrate your workloads from one cluster to another cluster. Uh, it creates full backup of uh, all the manifests uh, you create in EKS. Uh, it also takes uh, snapshots of all the volumes uh, that you use with your deployments of pods. Uh, we use it um, mainly if in a case we have uh, EKS upgrades. So before every upgrade, we do full cluster backup, uh, but it also allows to do Pair namespace backup and uh, it allows to migrate uh, environments between clusters if it if it is needed. Uh, cluster to scaler we use to scale our worker nodes <coughs> based on uh, capacity of our cluster. So when someone sp spins up a new environment, uh, 
cluster to scaler uh, works with uh, Kube scheduler. Uh, it constantly monitors uh, for fire events from scheduler and if environment if cluster has no enough resources to feed uh, some deployments, uh, it will automatically add new worker nodes by uh, increasing the number of instances in after scaling groups. And uh, similarly, if uh, someone spins down environment uh, and some nodes are underutilized, it will uh, delete those nodes uh, and it will drain Kubernetes node and uh, delete uh, AWS instance. AWS Kate's uh, node drainer, it's uh, basically a Lambda function that uh, works with uh, EKS API. So EKS API and uh, after scaling uh, events. So when uh, for some reason node is deleted from auto scaled group, it will uh, drain no, it will drain Kubernetes node uh, to gracefully remove it from cluster and uh, prevent any data loss. LB ingress controller is uh, the main ingress controller we use uh, in our clusters. Basically, it creates uh, one application load balancer per hour in a space and uh, groups uh, all the services behind this uh, application load balancer. It also automatically creates all the needed infrastructure of the uh, listeners, uh, target groups, uh, house checks, and so on. External DNS is used to update uh, DNS records uh, to sync DNS records from our ingresses to root 53. So every time you add a new ingress, it will detect changes and it will automatically create uh, and delete records uh, in route 53 hosted zones. Uh, so recently they've uh, added a lot of improvements to the service, but uh, several months before it had uh, it works as a polling mechanism. So it put uh, a route 53 API every year periodically every few minutes uh, to see if uh, DNS records are in desired state, uh, which causes a lot of problems with uh, API rate limiting when we created multiple clusters, but uh, now they changes uh, their behavior and uh, it is now event-based. So every time you make changes to ingresses, it will trigger uh, DNS change. EFS provisioner, it is a system component we use to provision EFS volumes. We use those volumes to attach to multiple pods uh, that uh, have to share some uh, storage between each, each other. And as uh, UI to our Kubernetes services, we use Rancher, uh, mainly because it uh, provides uh, integration with uh, different uh, tools like Okta, Active Directory, and so on. So we we have uh, fine graded uh, access control for all our de developers uh, to Rancher. We do not use it uh, as provisioner, uh, it is just basically used as UI to our Kubernetes services. So a few limitations we faced uh, while we were working with it. So first of all, EKS versions is behind uh, official release uh, Kubernetes versions. Uh, as if I'm not mistaken, the latest Kubernetes version is 1.18 and uh, release it EKS version is 1.16. So if you need some special things that are release it in latest versions, you will have to think about managing your own cluster. But other from that, it provides the, all the capabilities of Kubernetes uh, that is needed for daily work. Of course, it has some limitations, but uh, they are pretty rarely used and uh, can be uh, omitted. The other 
big limitation is if you use Amazon VPC CNI plugin, it uh, limits the number of pods uh, you can create per node uh, by uh, just because it allocates a private IP from VPC range to every pod and it is limited by instance type. The bigger instance type you have, the bigger number of uh, pods you can uh, you can allocate to this node. Uh, the big limitation uh, we faced recently is uh, you cannot change uh, subnets in for your EKS cluster once you create it. So previously we had uh, EKS clusters running only in public subnets, but we had to change it uh, to public and private subnets. So EKS does, does not allow you to change um, subnets where it is running. Uh, you can still have workarounds for it, uh, but uh, if you want to have few, but if you want to uh, fully utilize it, you have to recreate your clusters. And uh, during work with EKS, we faced a lot of uh, AWS API rate limits. Uh, mostly it is because of we are running a lot of clusters with a lot of uh, C2 nodes, and uh, the first API limit was root 53 limit, but uh, it was uh, mostly resolved by upgrading uh, this DNS sync tool. And now we almost don't see it. Uh, also, we had the limits on uh, API, API red limits on uh, application load balancers, on uh, SSM parameters, and so on. So it is uh, something you need to think in, in, advice, in advance and uh, the most of these limits are uh, and the way I say that uh, you cannot increase the most of these limits but uh, if you spend a lot of money on your AWS account they are always open for negotiation and uh, if you prove that you need a higher limit they can increase it. Uh, so let's talk about resource allocation. As we are running uh, dynamic environments, it is extremely impor important for us to utilize uh, resources as much as possible. So there, basically there are two types uh, of uh, resource allocation. It is requests and limits. Requests uh, use it uh, by Kubes scheduler to decide uh, where to fit new workloads and uh, limits uh, are used uh, to not to allow some workloads to use more resources that uh, they are allowed. Uh, behavior of uh, workloads depends on, on its kind, uh, I mean with limits. Uh, some workloads uh, just, uh, some workloads are killed by OAM killer when uh, we, when are uh, using uh, more memory than uh, limited, uh, some just uh, started to slow down. And uh, there are two main types of resource types. It is uh, CPU and memory. We used uh, neuralic graphs uh, to, to, cal to calculate how much resources we need per environment. So we, we created two test environments, uh, run regression tests for it, and you got all the metrics uh, for memory and uh, CPU utilization for every pod. So we set uh, requests as baseline, uh, and uh, we set it, uh, limits as uh, peak values plus 25%. So uh, for all our, for all our workloads, we are sure that we will not uh, hit those limits. And we are, and we, if we are hitting those limits, uh, it means that something is wrong with application and we need to investigate it. Uh, so to decide uh, which instance types and uh, how many of them we need, uh, we created uh, so-called uh, we added a so-called uh, divider. We divided memory by CPU, right? And got some index equals to almost eight. And based on that, uh, we also 
calculated those in the index for different instance types. And uh, as you see from this table, uh, R5 large, X large is uh, the instance type that uh, fits uh, the best for us. It is memory optimized instance because we use more memory than CPU. Uh, compute optimized and general purpose instances doesn't work for us uh, as a memory optimized instance. Uh, and uh, here is a uh, number of requests that are required for entire uh, environment. It is uh, almost three gigs of CPU and uh, 21 gigs of memory. So it is, uh, it almost fits as entire R5 XArch instance. Uh, but uh, when you choose not uh, appropriate instance type, you can have following situation when you have plenty of CPU, but you don't have uh, memory. Uh, you can see that uh, memory utilization is uh, almost two times uh, bigger than CPU utilization. Uh, and it can cause, cause uh, several problems. Uh, the biggest problem we faced was uh, that port was unable to schedule. We were at the maximum capacity of our cluster of such as seven nodes. And even though we, we had uh, almost 90%, 90 gigs of memory available, uh, no one of these nodes had enough memory to feed the largest pod. So the largest pod we had is requires uh, one gig of CPU and uh, five gigs of memory. So even though you have a lot of free memory in your cluster, no, no simple node has enough memory to feed this, this uh, pod. So it is uh, also pay attention for it and uh, it is uh, always better to uh, to not to use uh, the, such a big uh, pod and uh, try to uh, try to uh, try to use uh, several rest pods instead of one big if it, if it is possible uh, but after changing uh, to bigger uh, instance types uh, we don't have this issue anymore also we optimized some of our largest pods so now they uh, require less memory and we don't have the situation anymore so let's talk uh, few words about EKS upgrade. Uh, generally, it is three-step process. Uh, you have to upgrade the EKS control plane uh, first. AWS says that uh, in general, it will not add, add interruptions to your clusters, but uh, it may add some slowness in API requests. And, uh, occasionally, a few requests may fail, but I haven't seen any issues uh, during uh, management plane, uh, plate upgrade. After that, you have to upgrade uh, system services that are running on your node. It is uh, kube proxy, DNS, uh, and uh, several others, like CNI uh, plugin. Generally, UKS has uh, documentation on upgrade process, and it has tables with content uh, which version of service you have to run with uh, EKS version. And the last step is to upgrade worker nodes. Uh, there are two ways to do it. It is running upgrade when you upgrade nodes uh, in some batch uh, sizes. And the second one is blue-green upgrade when you create uh, additional worker groups with new version, migrate all your workloads to this new worker groups and uh, after that you spin down your old worker groups. Uh, generally saying uh, EKS upgrade process was pretty straightforward, but uh, it takes uh, some time because we perform a drawing update and uh, we waited for all the workloads to be rescheduled to, to new nodes and uh, for our clusters, it took about a week of work time to upgrade all the clusters. And uh, I can add that uh, we were updating from 1.12 to 1.15 version. 
and uh, during last weeks it has released a new version so we, we will have to perform a great one spot. Um, it is extremely important to pay attention of which version of EKS you use because uh, EKS deprecates old version and if you do not update your version manually before deadline, uh, it has, we, do, we do it automatically and uh, it can cause some unexpected downtime. So uh, you have to pay attention for it. Uh, so as, as we use environment on demand, uh, we often had a situation when someone started environment and uh, have forgotten to tear it, tear it down. So we implemented automated logic that scales and uses environments uh, to zero and uh, deletes environments after some period of inactivity. So basically it checks uh, activity on the load balancer for for environment and uh, if there are no requests for uh, some period of time, first it uh, sends uh, email notifications that, uh, to a person who created this environment that your environment will be uh, scaled down um, and you can resume it by running a CI drop. And uh, if you do not do it, it Will, you will not lose any data because uh, it only scales uh, workloads to zero. All the data are persistent. And uh, if uh, for bigger period uh, no one uh, resumes this environment, it, automatic, it is automatically deleted. Uh, it saves us uh, a good amount of money because uh, for example, teams uh, from our site are working to on environments only during their working hours and uh, it, and uh, after they uh, stop working on it uh, at, at the end of working days, uh, after some time this job uh, scales environments to zero and uh, cluster to scale or scales down to scaling groups and we, we use last resources. When developers came come back uh, at the next day uh, to their work, they resume the environments uh, with all the data needed and uh, continue working on it. So several interesting issues we faced uh, during preparing to move. So the first one is uh, had a very interesting symptom. Uh, in Kubla to logs, we had uh, error message about uh, the sites conflicts, the container name is already in use by container. Uh, generally saying it is very rarely seen issue in Docker, but it is still possible when for some internal reason uh, it uh, creates uh, a new container with the same name as already existing container. But in our case, it, the reason was uh, in order. Uh, we've seen this issue only when we were running uh, a job that has a big Docker image. And uh, after investigation, after uh, scrolling through a lot of forums and uh, Docker and Kubernetes issue, uh, we finally seen that uh, the real issue is slow EBS volume that is attached to our nodes. So for some reason, someone adjusted memory limits for FluentD and uh, someone gave FluentD to less uh, memory. And for that reason, FluentD started to write uh, to cache data on disk and uh, it consumes all the burst uh, balance credits for EBS volume and uh, it became very slow. And for some race condition in Docker, uh, it thought that it deleted container, but actually it didn't and uh, throws this uh, kind of errors. After increasing memory limits for FluentD, uh, we increased our burst balance for volumes and uh, we don't see an, this kind of error anymore. And as far as I know, it was fixed in uh, recent versions of Docker and Kubernetes. So uh, you do not 
probably you will not face this issue anymore, but uh, it's still worth to know. Another kind of issue, it is uh, issue related to Rancher. So we we use Rancher um, as UI as and as proxy to our EKS API server. So every developer, when uh, it uses kubectl, uh, it talks not directly to EKS API, it talks through Rancher. Uh, so occasionally in uh, Rancher agent, we've seen this kind of uh, issues that uh, it can connect to a proxy uh, due to input output amount. Uh, we've seen this issue when we are uh, performing some uh, environment up upgrades uh, in the middle of the day when a lot of uh, developers uh, did their deployments uh, so while it's to API increase it. Uh, temporary workaround, in, workaround is to scale uh, cattle cluster agent. Uh, on, on clusters, it is a uh, brancher agent, but the real issue is somewhere, be, uh, somewhere in ALB misconfiguration or MTU mis misconfiguration is in uh, Amazon C9 plugin. Uh, we still work on this issue and we do not have permanent solution well, uh, as yet, but um, we scale it our agents uh, so it uh, do not slow down our development. Another interesting issue is that sometimes when we do rollout status, uh, it unexpectedly, unexpectedly closes weight and to throw this kind of error. So as uh, one of final step in our CI jobs, we have uh, we have checking of all the deployments. So we check all the deployments if they are successfully rolled out. So it uh, gets all, all the deployments and uh, goes through all of them uh, to see if they are ready. So, and occasionally we see this issue that uh, watch closed before until timeout. And this error comes not from uh, kubectl, it comes from uh, underlying infrastructure. So most probably it is uh, related to previous issue with Ranger, but also it is, good, it is possible that ALB closes WebSocket connection uh, due to inactivity. We also do not have permanent fix for the solution. We are actively working on it. Uh, so we still have a few steps uh, left uh, to for this solution to be fully ready to move to production. Uh, from development uh, point of view, we need to implement shared environment. Uh, so, so developers will not have to spin up uh, entire isolation environment. They will have to spin up only those services they made changes to and uh, reuse other services uh, that, uh, that are running stable code from some shared environment. Uh, about uh, production, we need to perform load testing uh, to see how much load we can uh, how much load our infrastructure can have. And we also need to implement disaster recovery plan uh, just in case uh, when we have some issues in the main AWS region or issues, some issues with uh, UKS. It is uh, the main things uh, left. So I've covered uh, on high level, high level pretty, pretty much I want it. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask it. Uh, hi, it's a close three. Uh, can you maybe skip this part, but how uh, you make a decision if environment isn't used for last eight hours? scale it down so and basically i've sense that you just scale down all the deployments or replica sets and so on right yeah so we periodically check activity on application load balancer uh, we check number of requests to load balancer if 
and if we have zero requests for rest period, we scale this environment. Mm. So you uh, you use one load balance one load balancer per one uh, namespace. Yes. Mm. But it's application load balancer, right? Yes. It is not ideal, but uh, it is the best option we have. And uh, do you use uh, this uh, service account rules to provide permission to access to AWS for your applications? Uh, we have plans to use it, but uh, we are not. Imp we have not implemented it yet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned it about Fargate. So, uh, as I understood, currently this all stack is running in, uh, like, not in Fargate, but in EKS. Like, why have you decided to not use Fargate? And is it HIPAA compliant? Maybe. Uh, so, uh, when we started this project, uh, Fargate it was not available for EKS. So we started uh, running our workloads on manage on uh, EC2 nodes. Uh, as far as I know, Fargate is HIPAA compliant, but uh, it fits better for some um, some uh, peak workloads uh, when you need some additional capacity for short periods of time. And if you are running some steady workloads. Uh, with uh, some some baseline work workloads, uh, it will cost more than running GC2 instances. Okay, thank you.